the facts of Nigerian oil industry are well known and stark. Between 1970 and 1995, Nigeria earned over $200 billion from oil exports. A spike in global oil prices during the 1970s sent the government's income skyrocketing. The 1970s oil boom brought unprecedented riches to Nigeria that had not been dreamt of at independence. Nigeria's earnings from crude oil exports rose by over 500% between 1970 and 1974. The oil boom massively increased Nigeria's wealth and created a nouveau rich with an insatiable appetite for foreign luxury goods. Although the newfound oil wealth created and enriched a small coterie of overnight millionaires, it failed to become a vector for mass economic growth and mobility. Nigeria became a wealthy country full of poor people. Nigeria's per capita income barely changed during the 25 years between 1970 and 1995. The people who live in the oil producing areas, the so-called Niger Delta, pay a steep price to sustain Nigeria's riches. More than 40,000 oil spills have occurred since oil was first commercially drilled in Nigeria in 1956 at Oloibiri in present-day Bayelsa State. The ubiquitously quoted statistic is that 70% of Nigeria's foreign exchange earnings come from oil exports. The statistic hardly ever quoted is that 80% of Nigeria's oil is obtained from only four of the country's 36 states, Akwaibom, Bayelsa, Delta and River states, all of which are in the Niger Delta. The four states bore the overwhelming financial burden of the remaining 32 states and the federal capital made conflict virtually certain. Despite providing the vast majority of Nigeria's wealth, the oil-producing states remained among the poorest and least developed regions in Nigeria. Apart from frequent oil spills, oil companies engage in a peculiar practice termed flaring. Natural gas is a byproduct of oil extraction. Rather than capturing and selling the gas as they do in other countries, international oil companies operating in Nigeria burn the gas in the open air. These flames burn 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, all year round. One particular flame in the Niger Delta has been witnessed by the altar for decades from miles away and has been burning for over 50 years. Flaring produces other hazardous side effects. It causes acid rain which contaminates rivers and farmland. In an area where farming and fishing are the primary traditional sources of livelihood, the effect is particularly deleterious. The government had many chances to address the injustice of the country's oil industry, but either ignored them or ruthlessly suppressed the agitation in the Delta. In February 1966, a maverick Ijo former police officer Isaac Adaka Boro, who had been fired for going AWOL from duty, led a group called the Niger Delta Volunteer Force NDVF in declaring the oil-producing Niger Delta area an independent republic. Nigeria's first military government, led by Agui Ronsi, responded to the declaration by arresting and trying Boro and his NDVF colleagues and sentencing them to death. The Ogoni are an ethnic group located in a densely populated pocket in southeast Nigeria. By the early 1990s, the Ogoni numbered approximately 500,000. The Ogoni comprised six clans, the Babi, Eleme, Gukana, Kenkana, Iyokana, and Tai. This small ethnic group, which represents less than 1% of Nigeria's population, mounted a spirited protest and publicity campaign that brought their plight and the injustices of Nigeria's oil industry not only to the doorstep of the Nigerian government, but also into the conscience of the living rooms of the people around the globe. As the biggest oil company operating in Nigeria, the Anglo-Dutch oil company Shell was a major target of residents of the oil producing communities. By 1990, Shell operated more than a thousand oil wells in Nigeria linked by 1,700 kilometers of pipelines. 96 of those wells were located in Ogoni land, which was crisscrossed by pipelines laid by Shell and other oil companies. Ogonis estimated that 900 million barrels of oils had been extracted from their land and had earned 
30 billion US dollars in revenue for the Nigerian government. Although oil from their land made the Nigerian government rich and was used to develop other parts of Nigeria, Ogoni land suffered from institutional underdevelopment, pollution, unemployment, poverty, and lack of education. In January 1990, the Ogonis launched an organization called the Movement for the Survival of the Ogoni People, MOSOP, as an umbrella movement for the Ogoni emancipation. They also drafted an Ogoni Bill of Rights that demanded political and economic autonomy for the Ogoni, royalties for the oil extracted from Ogoni lands, and compensation for environmental damage caused by oil drilling. Mossop issued the Bill of Rights on August 26, 1990 at Bori, the traditional capital of Ogoni land, and it was signed by 30 prominent Ogonis, including the head of five of the six Ogoni clans. Mossop sent a copy of the Bill of Rights to the federal government and also a demand notice to oil companies telling them to leave Ogoni land if they were unwilling to pay compensation for the environmental devastation caused by their oil exploration. Mossop also flew an Ogoni flag and adopted Abo Abo Pa Ogoni, which means Rise Up, Rise Up Ogoni as the Ogoni National Anthem. Mossop's president, Garrick Barili Lenten, was a biochemist and a former government official who had previously served as Commissioner for Health in River State and as Federal Commissioner for Education. Its vice president, Edward Kobani, was also a former government commissioner and the national publicity secretary of the SDP. The group's publicity secretary was a childhood friend of Kobani, Kenule Ken Saruwiwa. Kobani and Saruwiwa had known each other for over 30 years. It was Kobani who coined the name Movement for the Survival of the Ogoni People and Saruwiwa who was instrumental in drafting the Bill of Rights which he described as the Bible of the Movement. Although he was not Mossop official leader, Saruwiwa was his star player. Mossop and Saruwiwa are so closely intertwined that it's impossible to discuss one without the other. The movement's evolution largely followed the trajectory of Sarawiwa's life. Sarawiwa claimed that while he was working in his study one night in late 1989, he received a spiritual calling to dedicate himself to uplifting and promoting the cause of the Ogoni people. Sarawiwa was a diminutive pipe-smoking man standing only 5 feet 2 inches tall with a Napoleon complex to boot. He carried two enormous chips on his narrow shoulders one due to the teasing he received about his height and the second a result of being the victim of ethnic chauvinism. As a student, he attended government college Umahia, an elite school in Nibu land. As the only Ogoni in a school of 300 students, most of whom were Igbo, Sarawiwa soon learned to fight his own battles. While there, he was subjected to taunting by Igbo classmates and reminded of the Ogoni's supposedly inferior status. The mistreatment that Sarawiwa and other Ogoni suffered at the hands of their Igbo neighbors reinforced their resolve to strengthen and defend Ogoni land identity and cohesion. A civil war erupted when the Igbo-dominated eastern region succeeded from Nigeria in 1967 and declared itself an independent republic known as Biafra. Ogoni land was included in the territory that the Biafrans carved out for their new states. When the Nigerian government used force to retrieve its territory, civil war erupted. Sarawiwa made no secret of where his loyalties lay. He bitterly opposed Biafra and supported the federal government. He did not wish to substitute minority subject status in Nigeria for minority subject status in a new Igbo-dominated country. He later published a memoir of his experiences during the war entitled On the Darkling Plain. The book included lacerating criticism of the Nigerian and Biafran leaders. However, his scorn for the Igbo leaders of Biafra burned even more intensely in the book. Igbo did not forget this and regarded him as a saboteur of their cause. Sarawiwa had not always opposed the oil companies. As a young man, he had applied unsuccessfully for a job with Shell. The federal government appointed him as the administrator of Boni Island on November 11, 1968, at just the age of 26. He later became Commissioner for Works, Land and Transport before moving to the Education Ministry in 1969 
as the first commissioner for education in River State. He used this post to address the educational underdevelopment of Ogonis. By the mid-1950s, only one Ogoni had ever attended university. Sarawewa granted educational scholarships to hundreds of Ogoni youths, thereby creating a new school and university educated Ogoni class that respected him and owed him fierce loyalty. His involvement in government led to his meeting and forming friendships in the 1960s and 1970s with senior army officers such as Colonels Obasanjo and Danjuma. Sarawewa's military friends included a quiet army officer named Sani Abacha, who lived next door to him on Nzimiro Street in Portacot. The two men were close enough for their children to become playmates. Ken's son, Ken Jr., became good friends with Abacha's elder son, Ibrahim. Sarawewa was most famous as a satirical journalist, playwright, and screenwriter. He wrote for a massively popular Nigerian television program called Basi and Company, which drew audiences of 30 million viewers. His presence in Mossop was a huge boost for this group. His celebrity status and local and international contacts helped the group to disseminate his message far and wide. Mossop Zenith came in January 1993 when it organized an enormous Ogoni Day rally attended by 300,000 people. Mobilizing 60% of the Ogoni population for this rally was a staggering achievement. At the rally, Mossop leaders, including Sarawiwa, led chants of no to Shell and demanded that the company leave Ogoni land. Sarawiwa declared Shell persona non grata in Ogoni land and told the crowd, I do not want any blood spilt. Not of an Ogoni man, not of any strangers among us. We are going to demand our rights peacefully, non-violently, and we shall win. Sarawiwa was so proud of the Ogoni rally day that he declared that he would have died a happy man had he died that day. To bind every Ogoni to the cause, Mossop also established a one naira Ogoni survival fund to which every Ogoni man, woman and child was asked to make a symbolic contribution of one naira. Mossop mounted an extremely successful PR campaign to bring the Ogoni's plight to the attention of the international community. His consistent and singular narrative of a small, oppressed minority group being crushed under the combined weight of greedy, exploitative international oil companies, especially Shell, and a ruthless and unsympathetic military government resonated with international audiences. Mossa presented their grievances to the United Nations and collaborated with foreign production companies to produce the documentary film Delta Force and the Drilling Fields. For 30 years, the Ogoni people have quietly endured military oppression and have watched their environment become polluted by oil. Now they have had enough. This film is their story. scenes of environmental degradation and violence in these films shocked international audiences and garnered sympathy for Ogonis overseas. Mossop's campaign was well-timed as it coincided with increasing global awareness and sensitivity to environmental issues. The Ogonis' demands and protests threatened to block the arteries that kept oil flowing, the lifeblood of Nigeria's government. By demanding autonomy and control of natural resources on their land, the Ogoni were indirectly asking the government to surrender some of its power to a small ethnic group that constituted a tiny part of Nigeria's population. The federal government could not imagine Mossop's demand since they posed uncomfortable questions about the nature and existence of the Nigerian Federation. Mossop's successful publicity machine gained the federal government's attention. On two occasions in 1993, the federal government invited Sarawewa and Mossop leaders for talks in the capital, Abuja. Ogoni leaders, including Sarawewa, Kobani, Letten, Albert Bade, and Dr. Bennett Birabi, met first with the Inspector General of Police, Ali Wata, in January 1993. Then on May 7, 1993, they held meetings in Abuja with the National Security Advisor, Lieutenant General Aliu Mohamed Gusau the Director of Military Intelligence, Brigadier Haleru Akilu, and the Secretary to the Federal Government, 
Aliu Mohamed. At both meetings, the government asked the Ogoni delegation to summarize their grievances and demands in a memorandum, provide a list of unemployed Ogoni youths, and submit a comparative analysis of the treatment of oil producing areas in different parts of the world. In the meantime, the security officers ominously cautioned that Mossop should cease from confrontational activities. The year 1993 was a tense time. The military was preparing for a landmark presidential election to return the country to democracy. Intramilitary tensions were high and the last thing it needed was disturbance in the oil sector. Mossop may have been impressed that the government granted them an audience with such a high power delegation. However, the fact that the government representatives for these meetings were leaders of the security and intelligence agencies should have signaled to Mossop that the government perceived it as a security risk and that Mossop was now swimming in the dangerous shark tank of federal politics. The presence of Lieutenant General Mohammed Anakilu at the second meeting virtually ensured that the head of state, General Babangida's ears and eyes were in the room even if he was not there physically present. Babangida had finely tuned antenna for detecting subversion and he surrounded himself with men of like mind. Akilu and Mohammed were two of his closest military confidants going back several decades. Mohammed was then the longest serving military intelligence officer in the army and had known Babangida for almost 30 years. He was the godfather of Nigeria's modern intelligence network. Akilu's job was to sniff out signs of rebellion against Babangida. Akilu had well honed military credentials. During the Matisene religious riots in the early 1980s, Akilu, then a major, was the commanding officer of 146 Infantry Battalion. His troops, together with soldiers from 202 Armored Battalion, conducted a brutal and bloody suppression of the riots that involved using tanks and firing artillery in heavily populated city centers to subdue and kill over 5,000 members of the Matasini sect. In October 1986, a trailblazing investigative journalist, Dilegiwa, was called in for questioning by intelligence officers working for Akilu. Giwa had been working on articles regarding the inner intrigues and controversies of members of the military government. The next day, Akilu phoned Giwa's house, spoke to his wife and asked for Giwa's address and a physical description of his home. On the following day, unidentified men dropped off a parcel bomb at Giwa's house, which killed him in his study. Giwa's family accused Akilu of organizing his murder. Akilu denied responsibility and persuasively argued that if he wanted Giwa dead, he wouldn't have been stupid enough to phone Giwa's wife two times and keep telling her that I am the one phoning. Mohammed and Akilu were hard, grizzled men, experts in security, not environmental matters. Their primary objective was security and order. For Mossop's campaign to have even the slightest chance of success, it was absolutely vital for it to remain peaceful. Unfortunately, Mossop's youth did not hear the message.